So we are differentiating sine x and cos x. We're going to do this by using first principles and then using a geometric method and hopefully uh, understanding why uh, we get the results we do when we differentiate trigonometry. Now the first thing to think about is our unit circle. Remember when we look at sine graphs and co cosine graphs, um, they come from having a circle with a radius of 1, um, an angle that we know, and that the sine graph is drawn um, by finding the opposite length, okay, or the height of the triangle. So the red line here indicates sine of 33, and that changes as the angle changes. And as I go around the circle, I draw my sine curve. Similarly, when I do my cosine graph, I use the adjacent side and I plot that. Now, thinking about our small angle approximation, I'll quickly go through where these come from. Um, just to remind you, hopefully you already know, but just in case. If we start with uh, part of this unit circle, so the, the circle would continue kind of onwards this way, uh, this way, and we're thinking about very, very small angles here. So I'm going to put my angle of th theta in here. Uh, just to quickly remember, we are in radians. This does not work in degrees, and the reason for that is that this length here, as an arc, is pi. Sorry, is um, theta radians. Okay, so this is theta radians. The length here is one, and the length here is one. So that's why we have this theta radians as our arc length, and. All we're going to do is think about what these two lengths are here. Well, this one must be sine theta because it's opposite, and this one here at the bottom must be cos theta. This length in here then is therefore 1, the radius, minus cos theta. Now, the first thing to think about with small angle approximation is when this gets very, very small. This length here, the opposite length, and the arc length are roughly the same. So sine theta roughly equals theta for small angles. And you know you can check a few values on your calculator. Um, sine of 0 0.1 gives you 0 0.099 dot dot dot. 0 0.2 is 0 0.19 dot dot dot. And then finally, sine 0 0.3 gives you about 0 0.29. Okay, so you get these approximated answers, and they work pretty well. For cos, it's slightly more difficult to work out. And the way we do it is we put in another line here. And we say, okay, well, I've got another right angle triangle here. And this hypotenuse here must be about theta radians because it's even a better an approximation to this curved arc. Okay, so we say that the hypotenuse is about theta. So therefore, we have is a triangle with a hypotenuse of theta, a side here of one minus cos theta, side here of sine theta. So all we do is we set it up using Pythagoras, we say I have theta squared equals sine theta all squared plus one minus cos theta all squared. This gives me sine squared theta plus one minus two cos theta plus cos squared theta. Now the sine squared theta and the cos squared theta combine using our identity to equal one. So we have one plus one, which is two minus two cos theta. If I rearrange this, I get two cos theta equals two minus theta squared. So finally I have cos theta equals one minus a half theta squared. Okay, so that is uh, 
for my second small angle approximation. So my first one, sine theta is about the same as theta. Cos theta is about the same as one minus a half theta squared. Okay, and these are really helpful when we are working through differentiating from first principles. So remember when I differentiate from first principles, um, thinking about it as a graph, if I have some function and I choose two points on it, and those two points are a distance of h apart, then this one here, we'll call this point here f of x, okay, so this height here is f of x, and we'll have another point which is f of x plus h, okay, it's h on. So we have a triangle, and in this triangle, the height of that triangle is f of x plus h minus f of x, and the base of that triangle is h. So when I do, so when I want to find the gradient, I do up divided by across, so I do f of x plus h minus f of x over h, and that gives me the gradient. Now the gradient function is what we're after, that's what differentiating gives us. But this is not great because we've got two points which are far apart, so I'm going to be doing some sort of approximation. Um, so all what I do is I say I'm going to make this h distance smaller and smaller and smaller until these two points are infinitely close together. Now once those points are infinitely close together, I get a gradient at that point. And to do that, you bring in a limit and you drag h towards zero. You say I'm going to make h smaller and smaller and smaller. These two points get closer and closer together. Therefore, you get a much more accurate answer. Now, we don't just bung in h equals zero for good reason. Um, if h was zero, the gradient would be undefined. Okay, so that's why we have a limit and we don't put in h equals zero. Okay, so if we have f of x is sine x and we want to find f dash x, we want to differentiate it, then we need to use first principles to start with. So we use f of x plus h minus f of x all over h and we put in what we know. So sine of x plus h minus sine x all over h. Now sine of x plus h becomes sine x cos h plus sine h cos x. This is because of the addition rule. I'm going to use a straight line here because I don't trust myself. There we go. Okay, so now what we do is we group together the sines and coses. So we have cos h minus 1 over h times sine x. So we write cos times by sine x. Plus, we do the same for cos. So what we've got cos, we've got sine h over h cos. Okay, well, let's think about these over here. So if I have a limit of h to 0 for sine h over h, well, I know that sine h roughly equals h because of my small angle approximation. So therefore, this must equal 1. Okay, so sine h over h becomes 1. Um, if I do the same for cos h minus h, sorry, minus 1 over h, I have cos h minus 1 over h. Now, thinking about cos h, um, cos h 
is going to equal 1 minus a half h squared minus 1. That first part is our small angle approximation. So this becomes 1 minus 1 is 0, divide by h, this becomes minus a half h. Now as h tends towards 0, minus a half h is going to tend towards 0 as well. So cos h minus 1 over h becomes 0. So f prime f dash x, this term disappears, and I'm left just with cos x. Okay, so if I start with sine x, I get cos x. Right, we're going to go through the rest of them. Okay, so my function, so my function is cos x now. Let's go for it. So so in this case, I have cos of x plus h minus cos of x over h. Now cos of x plus h, remember using addition formula, gives me cos x cos h minus sine x sine h and then we subtract the cos x Again, what we're going to do is we're going to factorise this. So we have cos h minus 1 over h multiplied by cos x minus sine h over h sine x. Okay, so as before, sine h over h becomes 1, cos h minus 1 over h becomes 0, so I'm left with minus 1 times sine x. So when we differentiate cos, I get minus sine x. Okay, so I've gone cos, so I've gone from sine, differentiate, I get cos, differentiate, I get minus sine. Now you could do this again with minus sine x to get minus cos x, um, and it's the same principle, okay? You can follow it through. So the kind of pattern I follow is sine x, differentiate it, I get cos x. Differentiate it, I get minus sine x. Differentiate it, again, I get minus cos x, differentiate again, I get back to sine x, okay? And it goes round in a circle, okay? Um, if I integrate it, I go back the other way, okay? Um, but you just need to know this, this pattern. Sine goes to cos, cos goes to minus sine, minus sine goes to minus cos. So just to reiterate again, sine x, cos x, minus sine, minus cos, okay? So you can just use this a little bit. You can just say, for example, if f of x equals sine x, and you don't need to do it from first principles, you can just go ahead and use your knowledge and say it's cos x. Um, if I have um, f of x equals, for example, cos 2x, I just need to think about what this is going to become. Cos x becomes minus sine. And this little 2, I need to differentiate again as well. So this would become minus 2 sine 2x. Okay, so you can just use these in calculation. Uh, you could have a whole string of trig and you'll be able to differentiate it. It's important though that you also understand the graphical method for this and where this comes from. 
So here is a graph of sine x, um, maximum of one, minimum of minus one, and it goes full circle in two pi radians. So sine x, we know when we differentiate sine x, it's going to become cosine x. Um, so let's look at this in terms of um, just the gradient function and see how that works. So what I'm going to do is I have a point here, A, which is on the line of sine x, and it travels along quite happily, going from 1 to 0 to minus 1 to 0. Um, yeah. Now, if I put a, a tangent on at this point, this shows me the gradient as I travel along the graph of sine x, and as we can see, it goes positive to 0 to negative to 0 to positive to 0. Now remember that when we differentiate something, we are just finding the gradient function. So what I've done is I have included the gradient. So when we get to the top here, we get a gradient of zero. Here, at this point, we get a maximum gradient, which is one. At this point, we get a minimum gradient, which is minus one, and then we go down to zero again. So you may already be able to sort of think about what's gonna happen, but let's just sort of let it play and uh, see how it gets on. So what, I'm gonna, what I've done is I've actually set up a graph to plot the same x coordinate here, but to plot on the y-axis the gradient of this sine x graph. So here, as you can see, when we are at zero, the gradient is maximum. So I have a gradient point of one here. And as I go through, Don't quite know why that is. There we go. So as I go through, I'm plotting the gradient of the sine x graph. That's all I'm doing. So I'm just plotting that. Um, I'll give it a quick shake and let it draw itself. But we can see as the gradient changes, when I plot the gradient in black here, it's drawing a graph that we know quite well. We started off with the sine x graph, and what we're plotting here is the cos x graph. Okay. So if I put in cos x, we can see that the gradient function is following the graph of cos x. So when I differentiate sine x, I'm just finding the rate of change of um, the sine x graph, which gives me cos x. Okay, well, let's stop that there. And let's change it up. So, let's change it to a cos x graph. So in this case, we're starting with a cos x graph. Put a point on. I'm going to put a tangent there. I'm gonna have the slope of that tangent. And I'm going to plot The coordinates here. So this is our cosine graph and if we think about it at zero we have a maximum we have a minimum gradient so it should be zero and as we go down we get a maximum negative gradient here so it should be minus one which it is. Here, we should be going back through zero because the gradient of the cosine graph is zero. As you go up, we get a maximum positive gradient of one. Again, another zero, minus one, another zero. So the graph we're plotting here is a flipped version of the sine graph. It is minus sine x, okay? So the gradient function of, co of cosine is negative sine x. Okay, so if we start with minus sine x as a graph, here it is. And I do exactly the same process.
then when I move it, my minus sine x, my negative sine x graph gives me a plot which is negative cos x. Okay, and just to complete the pattern, if I go, if I start with negative cos x, when I differentiate it, when I find its gradient function, I should get back to my first graph, which was sine x. So minus cos x, the gradient function, gets me back to my first graph of sine x. Okay, so I can plot them all on here and you can see it makes a lovely pattern. Um, all I'm doing with sine x and cos x is finding the gradient function. So finding the gradient function gives me the graph below sine x becomes cos x, cos x becomes minus sine x, minus sine x becomes minus cos x. Okay, that's pretty much it. That's all there is to it. Remember when we differentiate, if you're doing it from first principles, you need to use your uh, small angle approximations. But if you're doing it just normally, remember the order it goes in and remember to use the chain rule when appropriate.